Welcome to the lecture Bureaucratic Logic in the course Narratives We Live By, which is part of the University Minor Culture and Cognition. There's much uh, academic and pseudo-academic research and work about bureaucracy. Much of it explains bureaucracy in the context of large organizations and their management, uh, some of it in the context of political studies and the management of the nation state and its policies, seeing the state as a large organization. In spite of acknowledging the difficulties bureaucracy brings with it, much of the discourse talks about it being the best possible solution to the problem it sets to solve, which is the efficient running and managing of the organization. Bureaucracy exists in all large institutions, not only the state, but also universities. Universities are sometimes uh, state institutions, but in the private sector as well. As companies grow, the need for a larger bureaucratic strata also grows. Bureaucracy is associated with extended hierarchy and a large apparatus of strict protocols and regulations. A protocol is a list of processes and activities which should be taken whenever a certain goal has to be reached and a list of documents that should be produced and submitted by way of executing the protocol. Individual experience of bureaucracy is of a line of bureaucrats who are obsessed with documentation and therefore demand much effort of filling out forms, bringing a pile of documents, signing, classifying activities according to strange categories, all of which delay the actual activity which it sets out to do, be it registration to a university, receiving medical treatment at a hospital, getting approval for building a shed in the yard, or even being allowed to bring the package into your home. This is a very short delay of only signing a form, but still a sort of counterintuitive act and a delay. Bureaucracy is something we love to hate. One can find many analysis uh, and narratives and discourses of how horrible bureaucracy is, how unhumane it is, and how it is the enemy and the symbol of everything bad in our world. Before I join this crowd, I would like to look at the phenomena of uh, bureaucratic logic from a cultural, cognitive, and cultural cognitive perspective to see what is good about bureaucracy and what is evo the evolutionary advantages of it. For this, we should be non-judgmental about bureaucracy, at least for a short while. I will not talk about bureaucracy per se, about institutions or about bureaucrats, but about bureaucratic logic, the cognition behind bureaucracy. The great name that is always mentioned with regard to bureaucracy and Western culture is the 19th century sociologist Max Weber. Uh, so we will look at what he said. We will then turn again to the anthropologist Don Handelman, who coined the term bureaucratic logic, which is how he conceptualizes the idea of bureaucracy. The theory of the neurological theory of predictive brain, as explained by Lisa Feldman Barrett, will give us the neurological model which is mirrored in the bureaucratic systems. We will then look at how societies use the tool of, bureaucracy, of bureaucratic logic, and of course, as usual, frame it within Donald's cognitive strategies. Max Weber was a 19th century thinker. He thought and wrote about rationalism, modernity, the modern police, politics, European society and economy. He was also a professor of economics at the Albert Ludwig University in Weiburg for a short time. He's mostly known nowadays for uh, his book, The Protestant Ethics and the Spirit of Capitalism, in which he explains the emergence of modern Western culture as a product of Protestant as opposed to Catholic ethics. But he was a prolific writer and has many other works, all a result of deep thinking about and sharp observation of Western society. 
Weber dedicated a long chapter to bureaucracy in his book, Economy and Society, published by Moore Zeebeck in two, uh, 1922. He wrote about it in its sociological context and in the historical context of his own life, the Industrial Revolution and the rise of the nation state. He saw bureaucracy as directly following a rationalistic worldview. I will not go deeply or even systematically into what he says. I will just mention a few things to highlight Weber observation and deep thinking on the one hand, and also that we can see how thing, things uh, changed. According to Weber, bureaucracy is based on precisely defined and organized across the border competencies of various offices. These competencies are underpinned by rules, laws, or administrative regulations. There is a rigid division of labor, strict chain of command, and the capacity to coerce physical, sacred, or other is firmly restricted by regulation. That is, no one is allowed to exercise their power beyond the regulation. That is, no one is allowed to use power that originates outside the bureaucratic system. Further, Weber talks about officers of bureaucracy as in-depth specialists to undertake their specialized tasks. Modern public administration is based on documents that are preserved as original copies or as concepts, says Weber. This is an interesting point as it talks about the source of authority of bureaucracy and talks about the paper documents as the source of authority, as the, as the moment of connection between reality and the bureaucratic system. Bureaucracy has authority because it has the original document to prove its claim. And from this moment on, the moment of having the document, bureaucracy can start doing its classification, management, uh, applying regulation, etc., because it has the authority of the document. Let me also note here that the authority or authenticity of the document results from the signature on it and the stamp. The signature pointing to a real person being in touch physically with the document and approving of its content by signing it. And the stamp pointing to the institutional confirmation or witnessing of this ritual of the signature. This type of authenticity has by now changed to have a scanned document with a scanned signature, an interesting development uh, of which I will not elaborate here. Weber sees the work of the bureaucrat as a calling. For him, it is the materialization of rationalism. And while it has its dangers, Weber sees in the impersonality of bureaucracy a sign of its egalitarian and just way of ruling, and above all, the most efficient way. Bureaucratic management is contrasted by Weber with charismatic leadership. In the latter, people are moved to action because of their passion to follow the leader who engages them. In bureaucracy, there is no charismatic leader. There's no leader at all, inasmuch as we see in leadership a type of personal interaction. In terms of Donald's categorization, the rational attitude behind bureaucracy, the impersonality and the analytical nature certainly classifies it as cultural realization of theoretic cognition. Again, we see how the person, as we know it from mythic cognition, is deluded in the theoretical cognition. In the case of bureaucracy, the person is reduced to a signature. And from that moment on, it is the person who has to adapt to the bureaucracy and not the other way around. However, while Weber points to the elimination of interpersonal mythic type of relationship, in favor of regulatory non-personal interaction within the organization itself, this, in fact, does not happen in reality, as the clerks usually have already a well-defined mythic personality 
by the time they become part of the bureaucratic setup. So they bring with them a mythic reality into the bureaucratic environment. This is a weak point of bureaucracy when it is being contaminated with personal agenda instead of the rules and the regulations. But if the co-evolution of bureaucratic logic and the human race will continue, the human race will change in the direction of bureaucracy. People will become more and more theoretic in nature and the mythic person as we know it will be less and less common and will be less and less socialized into newborn humans. Weber talks about the professionality of bureaucrats. Indeed, professionals are hired to serve or work in the bureaucratic parts of institutions and companies, but they soon learn that what they have to specialize in is not their area, but their bureaucratic knowledge, which slowly comes to occupy more of their knowledge and more of their time. This reduces, of course, the efficiency of bureaucracy of which of which it is so proud. Weber was writing about bureaucracy relatively close to the inception of this phenomena in Western culture. So he didn't see these developments. Handemann writes about a century later than Weber, when bureaucracy is much more developed, not only in the sense of being bigger, but being more experienced, so to speak, and therefore standardized. It has now become a regular partner of nation state and other big organizations and in turn probably influence them back and the people that run it in what some scholars like to call co-evolution. Handelman talks about bureaucracy, not from a political studies or business administ administration perspective, but as an anthropologist looking at it as part of human behavior. He also does not share Weber's enthusiasm with human rationality. Bureaucratic logic, bureaucratic thinking, says Handelman, has to do with classification, classification of a particular kind. It's linear classification with two intersecting ax axes, vertical and horizontal. The vertical axis is composed of levels of classification in a hierarchy in which each level subsumes the lower and is itself subsumed by the level above. The horizontal axis, a given level of classification, is composed of n number of categories, each of which contrasts and excludes all others of the same level. All categories on the same level of abstractions are equivalent of one another. This logic does not produce a dichotomic distinction, but multi-distinctions. The classification does insist, however, that a given item be placed in one and only one of the existing categories on a given level of classification, and therefore that it be excluded from the rest of the items on this, uh, of, on this level. Bureaucratic logic is not democratic, dynamic, nor is it egalitarian one. And I would add, it is not, also not inclusive as each, at, at each of the levels, since, as Handelman says, to categorize requires boundaries that inform whether something belongs or not. According to Handelman, there are conditions for the development of bureaucratic logic. The one is emergence of conscious systematic cl classification of information that is made autonomous from nature. A second condition for the development of bureaucracy is the doing of classification organized as a system in the self-correcting way with the emphasis on the self as opposed to external input. And this makes bureaucratic entity further detached from actuality as a self-organizing entity. That is, that it is losing contact with the outside and reorganizes itself, if necessary, interacting only with its own part. So while bureaucracy might be presented as a very efficient, 
It also, in fact, uses a large chunk of the time and effort put into it into taking care of itself and not the thing for which it was set out to care and to be efficient. The information that bureaucracy boxes is partial. There's a box of citizens and a box of non-citizens. And other, under the citizens, you get a box of pregnant and a box of non-pregnant people. In the non-citizens, you get the box of Egyptians and the box of, box of Brazilians. But what happens if one is both pregnant and Brazilian or pregnant and Egyptian? For bureaucracy, this is an issue because these two categories do not belong under the same uh, higher level uh, category. They would therefore have to create a whole new subcategory of Egyptians who are pregnant or Brazilians. Further weakness is the fact that a higher level in the hierarchy stands for whatever is under it. In this case, if something in the higher level is eliminated, everything under it disappears too. So the system would try at all costs to keep it, the higher level, as it is so expensive and in time and money and expertise to replace everything that is under it. And also in terms of the flow of information, the information flow from the bottom to the top cannot go directly. It has to go through the whole apparatus of the various levels. And this is heavy and is a source of losing touch with reality. As a type of cognition, theoretic, bureaucratic logic is of course much older than the nation state or the modern bureaucracy. What is it in human cognition that enables the move to bureaucratic logic? Predictive brain or predictive coding is a theory about how the brain works. The simplest way to demonstrate it is by this uh, optical illusion, very famous one. There is no square depicted in this illustration, still we see one and the reason for this is that our brain creates it by filling in the, the gap what does it mean to fill in the gap here there is no gap there's simply no square but our eyes see the square because they use the memory to see what they think they will be seeing when only part of the information is available so in this case, the past experience was that whenever these corners are seen, there is a square. So here too, our eyes already see the square. They predict the square to be there and we see that. But what is the interest for us is the process by which the predictions are created and not the way they are then uh, executed back into reality, which we just experienced. The first step for creating the prediction is a process of summarizing sensory information into narrower information in order to save energy in, in the working of the brain. The multitude of sensory and interceptive information is narrowed into a summary. Here is an explanation of this process by the famous neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett. She wrote the book about how the, the book how emotions are made and has a new book now seven lessons about the brain so here is her explanation about the process of the predictive brain Imagine a bunch of neurons firing in some pattern. Now along comes a smaller group of neurons that are a little better connected to one another and they say, we can represent this pattern a little more efficiently. And so they do. And let's imagine this happens for every sense that you have, seeing, hearing, touching, and so on. So in this example, I've only depicted 
three different senses. This sort of thing happens all the time in your brain for efficiency. So smaller and smaller groups of neurons summarize what other neurons are doing. Eventually, a few big honking neurons represent all of these other summaries together at the front of the brain. They summarize actually an entire cascade. So you've got this pattern of neurons and smaller neurons firing and then some other neurons summarize that pattern and then some other neurons actually summarize that pattern and so on and so forth. Fewer neurons being used each time. This is actually how the brain works and we call this learning. When the brain predicts, the cascade is actually playing out in reverse. The biggest, best connected neurons launch predictions, each of which has a cascade into finer and finer and finer predictions as groups of smaller and smaller and smaller neurons all along the way um, fire in a different pattern until the cascade reaches the sensory and motor regions of your cortex, which actually have the smallest neurons of all. So a simulation is one big cascade of predictions. As it turns out, everything you see, hear, taste, and feel comes from these massive cascades of predictions. Your brain is launching thousands of these cascades of simulation in every moment, and some of them create emotions. So what Feldman Barrett explains is that the brain creates summarized units of information in her book, but not here in the clip. She calls these units concepts. Concepts are smaller in size from the entire information, but they have the information to invoke all other information when triggered by partial sensory input. For example, we see some uh, red patch in a supermarket and a part of a round form, and we already know and see uh, an apple. Had, it, had we seen this in a birthday party, we would have seen a clown's nose. Important for us, as I said, is the process of summary as a cognitive process, as this is what happens in bureaucratic logic. The creation of concepts in the brain is similar to the process of narrowing information in bureaucracy. In both cases, narrowing the information saves effort. In the cultural context, this enables the human organization to deal with much larger groups of people than was possible without the summary. Look at this table here. It is from the article by Douglas Macy a Brief History of Human Society, The Origin and Role of Emotions in Social Life from the American Sociological Review, Review of 2002. Macy talks about, uh, among other things, about the size of human societies and the size of human brain. So if we look at the increase in brain size in this table here, we see that since the Neolithic period, the brain size did not increase anymore and stayed stable until our days, 1,450 cubic centimeters. If we compare this with the growth of human social groups here, we see that it has risen manifold from a group of around 150 people to societies of 30 million in the large city, 30 million, million people who identify as belonging to the same unit of the city. And in terms of nation state, uh, this is of course much larger. In order to manage such a large number of people, the information about them has to be summarized. They have to be categorized into parts of the information about them. And many aspects have to be left out. So age and citizenship, marital status are part of the bureaucratic information. But friends, hobbies, style of speech, favorite foods are out. Not to speak about the sound of their voice or their current mood. 
What are the advantages of such uh, a summary? Viewing bureaucracy in this way makes clear what the great advantage of it is. Managing large populations means that large populations cooperate, act as one unit, and exercise much more power. Power of production, power to fight, power to defend, power to gather information and analyze it. And all these make the human race much more resilient. The disadvantage is the usual disadvantage of institutions, the effort needed to sustain them and the lack of flexibility in the face of reality. The story I will discuss later here is about the Israelites who journeyed in the desert on the way to the promised land after they were saved from being slaves in Egypt. But the first story for the presentation, the Israelite ask for a king, talks about a request the Israelites put in front of their prophet Samuel. This happened many years after they entered the promised land already. And in this request, they ask God to grant them a king. What they actually request is a change in leadership from a leader whose authority comes from God to a leader who is helped by a huge hierarchical structure. The prophet explains to them the disadvantages of such a structure and such a leader, but they insist, and indeed from this moment onward in the biblical narrative, a line of kings ruled the Israelites until the fall of their kingdom, first during the Babylonian conquest and later during the Greek one led by Alexander the Great. The second story, this one here, um, a book found in the temple, tells about a king who initiated a renovation in the temple of Jerusalem, which is the house in which God is worshipped. The renovators, managed by the priests, found a book in the temple. This was the book of laws of God given to the Israelites in the deserts centuries ago. This book talks about the punishment the people will suffer if they worship God in the wrong way. The book and its content were brought before the king and upon reading it, he began to worry as he realized that they were, the Israelites were worshiping God wrongly for many generations already. Consulting with a prophetess, they received a message from God that indeed this was the case. The people were worshiping wrongly for many years and therefore the people will be punished, which indeed happened. They were conquered and sent to exile. The authority of the book then does not take into account the fact that the people did not have the book and thus did not even know what the correct conduct actually was. The story of Nadab, Nadab and Abihu, these are names of two people, is part of the story of the Israelites in the desert. So these people, the Israelites, are being brought out of Egypt. They are on their way to the promised land and they are led by Moses. All of this is God's doing and God reveals himself to them in the desert. They promise to obey his commandments. He becomes their God. They become his people and then they build a temple to worship him but we are in the desert now, so it is not an urban type temple, uh, but what is called a tent of meeting, as you can see here uh, in the video. So it is a tent, it's a temporary building then ca that can be carried on when they move on to their next uh, stop. Aaron, who is Moses' brother, was appointed the chief priest and all his sons after him. So in chapter 9 of the book of Leviticus, which is the biblical book most dedicated to describing the priestly ideology and rituals. So in chapter 9, we find a long description of how a sacrifice was made. Along 24 verses, we hear which animals have to be taken and the priest, uh, by the priests and by the people, 
how they should be slaughtered, how the blood is poured over the altar, uh, which pieces of the animal are used for uh, which purpose, uh, about the bread that was sacrificed along with the, with, the, with the animal, the oil that was poured over the altar, how the priests go into the tent and they come out of the tent and how the fire comes down and from heaven and devours all the sacrifice, all these very elaborate details. The people who were out of the tent uh, saw the smoke coming out and they fell on their faces. So this is the regular way a sacrifice was made at the time. And these are the basic instructions for, uh, for making a sacrifice. So, so far so good. But then we find a very short story of some seven verses where the main event happens uh, in the first two verses. Um, and, this is, and this is the story. It is being read by uh, a YouTube channel that has uh, biblical readings. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people I will be honored. Aaron remained silent. Moses summoned Mishael and Elzaphan, sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Come here, carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the front of the sanctuary. So they came and carried them, still in their tunics, outside the camp, as Moses ordered. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not let your hair become unkempt, and do not tear your clothes, or you will die, and the Lord will be angry with the whole community. But your relatives, or the Israelites, may mourn for those the Lord has destroyed by fire. This story is an anticlimax to the elaborate, legitimate ritual described in the previous chapter. There, the many details commanded by God are enumerated and the obedient way in which they were followed. Our story tells about two people who acted on their own initiative. And while not doing something that is very different from the official ceremony, they acted in an unauthorized way. For this, they were killed. Their father was reproached, their family was not allowed to mourn them, and their cousins had to carry their bodies away and deposit them outside of the camp. The bureaucratic logic behind this story is the question of following the protocol. The two protagonists were of the right family. They were purified. They knew how to behave in the holy tent, but they acted in an unauthorized way. As the biblical narrative has it, soon after the official manner of doing sacrifice was established, all other ways became wrong and unauthorized and merited death. The punishment is indeed very harsh and the demand from the family not to mourn shows the narrowing down of the person to their official duties and the ignoring of the personnel, the mythic personnel as we know, in favor of the governmental role. It is now time to uh, tell you about the assignment for this week. The assignment is uh, to think of moves made by the government. It could be any government you know, a Dutch one if you're Dutch or some other, regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Where can you see that the need to work in bureaucratic logic way conflicted in the way things would take place if mythic cognition was used and there was no need for the bureaucratic logic to step in? Make a short video of two minutes uh, telling about this. 
Submit your answer in the assignment link found directly below this lecture on the date which is specified there. Thank you and see you in the next seminar.